In this video, we're going to be creating a line and wash urban sketch. This line and wash urban sketch. And I'm going to be taking you all the way from supplies, choosing your scene, getting your composition right, to finishing your sketch and feeling comfortable and confident all the way. I'll be talking about issues like how to choose your pen. And the top tip is it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what kind of pen you're using, except for one key thing, which we'll talk about shortly. We'll be looking at how to choose your scene. Now this does matter and people don't think about it enough. So tune in to that part of the video if you want to understand how to start picking your scene out so that you're going to have fun sketching. And then, of course, step by step, simple, easy techniques will create this beautiful little sketch together. The reference is down below and let's just get cracking, get started. If you want to find more of my teaching, you can, of course, find me on sketchloose.co.uk, super in-depth courses looking at all of these ideas and more. Or you can find me on Skillshare. The links to both of those things are down below. Firstly, let's think about the supplies as promised. So what I've got here is just simply a sketchbook. This happens to be made by CY to Brighton and inside we have lightly textured watercolour paper. Now that's important because line and wash is done with watercolours. We'll come to those in a minute. I like this size of A5 sketchbook or half letter. You can fill up the page quickly but it's not so small that you just end up doodling and not being able to create a proper painting if that's what you want as well. Inside here you can see a mix of different things which I've got lots of ink, some ink and wash but mostly ink drawings at the moment. That's because it's been Christmas and what I've been doing mostly is filling my time with doodles. These are the kind of things you can do with our ink pens but today we are going to paint, we are going to create lovely line and wash painting. You'll notice I've got a couple of clips on there. Now that's great because inside or out and about, it's really handy to be able to just snap down your page and not have it flop around. You could also use a bit of tape if you wanted. Now, what else have we got? Well, we've got a few pens. You could use any pen as long as it's waterproof. Many people will use things like this, these disposable pens. This is a few day pen and here we have a, a line now onto the pens. Most people, or many people at the beginning, will use these disposable pens. Here we have a fine liner. You can see the tip has a fine nib and inside is archival or permanent ink. But you can use other waterproof pens. For example, this is a few day pen. It's got a flexible nib on the end. It lets you make different marks. Many ballpoint pens are waterproof. They're really cheap, really handy to have around. You can also use different things like Posca pens with acrylic marker in. I've got an ink uh, rollable pen here. And inside some of these pens, I've got ink cartridges. So we can fill it up with our own waterproof ink. And with that comes my favorite option, which is the fountain pen. Here I've got a, a fountain pen with an extra fine nib on it. And we have inside it again, an ink cartridge. Now that ink cartridge has got waterproof ink in and that is a special ink. There's a few, this one is made by platinum. The fountain pen is also by platinum. So we really do need to just identify a pen with waterproof ink. But beyond that, anything goes, anything goes at all. A fountain pen is flexible, it gives me more than one line weight. So I can easily do a little scribble, maybe let's draw a little apple and then I can come and make a bold line that's more difficult with a fine liner. With a fine liner, we need two pens really to get those differences in weight of line. Last but not least, we have our watercolors. So the watercolors come in many shapes and sizes. Here I have lots of different tubes of Daniel Smith paint, which I've squeezed out into my own palette. But you can get boxes like this. This has got loads of colors in it. I can swish out lots of different colors. For me, this is actually too many colors. There's too many to, to choose from. I'm gonna get confused. But there are lots of different palettes. Another example here, this one's by Etcher, little uh, ceramic palette. And here I've got some tester colors that I can use. A really great beginner option would be something like the Winsor Newton Cotman uh, Sketchers box. Comes with 12 colors and it's a really well-designed palette and set of colors. With your colors, you'll need some water, more is always better, uh, some tissue or kitchen roll or a 
towel, I often use a microfiber towel, and lastly, of course, some brushes. So here I have a size 10 round brush and a quarter inch flat brush. Having two different sizes of brush is often handy. And with that, we can just jump in and get started. We don't need to be any cleverer than that. We can just jump in and start our sketching process. But that does bring us to the next question. And that question is, of course, scene selection. How do we choose our scene? And this is something where beginners will fall down. This, for example, is a really lovely scene. There's lots to like about it, but there's challenges. All these details, there's a person. We're really zoomed in. The closer you get in, the less you sort of have context to help you. If we sketch like this, we're gonna to have to do these books really well for someone to understand the scene. As we zoom out and zoom out, the shapes get bigger. We'll talk about shapes as we start to sketch, but also the ability to suggest the scene without overdoing it gets easier. We can go the other way and we can zoom out too much and we can end up with all sorts of challenges. Look at all these lines, we've got weird perspective going on and we just can't really see much to pick it out. I'm sure that with a lot of time and experience you could make this into an amazing sketch, but it's going to be a struggle. If we move off this way, we start to get scenes which are beginner friendly. And we start to think about as well, how do we make them even easier and even more friendly? So here, got a couple of buildings, a few chairs, they're a challenge, a little bit of perspective flowing down there. Now, if you're comfortable with perspective, this is a really lovely scene, but I would suggest as a beginner, just choose things without perspective. This is an example without perspective. Again, though, it's so zoomed in that it's really hard to actually work out how we could sketch that and make it interesting. This, this is a good option perhaps. It's very vibrant, it's interesting. We are zoomed out, we have no perspective. It's flat. We don't have angles going down the street. And here, another interesting option, but the challenge in the challenge in this one is, look, all the light is in the back. Now that's not gonna make a very interesting painting. And it's also why this photo looks a bit dead. But if you're confident in inventing the light and moving the light around, options like this are great. As a beginner though, again, I would recommend finding a photo where the light is already working for you. And that brings us back to here. So this is the scene we looked at running down and now we have lovely light, great bit of shadow. We've got straight on perspective. It's not perfect. That's one of the other key things. When we try and sketch something which is already perfect, We've got nothing to work with, nothing to be creative about. And it's really hard to see the alternative beauty in the scene because of how interesting the scene already is. This, for example, not a very interesting scene in many ways, but actually, for me, I'm drawn to this lovely perspective, all these grubby lines on the buildings. It's not what we call a chocolate box scene, but you could definitely get stuck into this and make something really interesting. So have a think about your kind of scene, the things you like, how much detail you're comfortable with, whether you're comfortable with perspective, and just make sure you are choosing the right scene for you. Now we are gonna have a fun with this. It looks complicated, doesn't it? It looks complicated, but actually it's got those key features of perspective zoomed out, and we're gonna be able to make something really fun of this. So this is gonna pop up in the corner, and we are just gonna go for it and start sketching. Now, you might notice this is a portrait building. It's very tall and narrow. So what we need to do is just move a few bits to one side. And the easiest way is gonna to be to sketch it in portrait as well. So if I just rearrange my desk, that will make life much easier for us. And we can just get stuck in. So what we're gonna do is find the shapes first. Now, if you're at all nervous about this stage, do a thumbnail, a little sketch. And here you can go, right, the building is a, a rectangle and it's split into three rectangles. In the middle, it's got a little sort of uh, half cylinder coming down. We've got a circle, we've got squares. And that way you can find the shapes, you can find these little bits coming in the side, you can find where things are. And in seconds, you've created a little scroll, but a little scroll which shows you, uh, gives you a bit of confidence that, that you can do this, that on a bigger scale, you're gonna get it about right. 
and about right is what we're after. So I'm going to start here at the bottom and I'm going to start by just setting the scale of the image by getting in these windows and doors and getting the sort of the width feeling about right. And I'm just doing it fairly roughly, very loose lines, wobbly wobblies. That's the way I love to sketch. Don't worry if you if you don't like this or you want to be less wobbly, that's fine. Um, it's just, I gain more fun from making my lines wobbly. And I think a little wobble to your lines does add a huge amount and it gives you flexibility. And we'll talk about that as we go through. Going up, we can then finish off the this little ground floor, can't we? So we've got this line coming up here to finish off this bottom rectangle. On the edge here, we talked about how we've got a sort of shape coming in, that's this tree. So we'll give this tree a little kind of triangle coming in, obstructing a little bit of, of our building. Then that gives way to a bit of that building line and we can start getting in our half cylinder. Here we go getting in our little marks and just sort of filling in a tiny bit of detail suggestion. Not detail, but it's suggestion of detail. And that's key is getting those ideas in without stressing yourself out. There's a lot going on here, but actually everything can be made into shapes. All these things can be turned into simple representations rather than actually uh, being totally perfect and, and putting all that stress on yourself. Same up here, we can just create the simple shape, the simple kind of cylinder shape. And then on top of that, if we want, we can start suggesting that there's some ornateness to it. And that's all we need to do. Or well, for me, that's all we need to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little story about, about comments we get about our art. Um, but while I'm doing that, all I'm going to be doing is continuing to kind of find these simple shapes and make them similar to one another so that our visual cortex instantly recognizes everything that is this shape is a window. And the story I want to tell, because I think it's really important um, as someone who creates art or as an artist, however you want to sort of define yourself in this creative space, to recognize that not everyone is going to like your art. So I had a fascinating short discussion with a gentleman who, uh, let's, let's shorten his lovely comment to, he doesn't like my art, it's totally implausible. Um, he actually did a, a quite well thought out comment. He put a comment on one of my videos explaining all the all the inaccuracies. And I, I said, um, you know, the reason I, I'm sketching is have a bit of fun and I, I appreciate their inac inaccuracies, but that's not what I'm looking for in my art. I'm looking for the fun side and a little representation of the art. Um, he uh, disagreed that this was art. It was totally implausible and therefore ridiculous. So, that's fine, you know, not everyone will like that. For me, the idea of creating a hyper-realistic, really accurate bit of art is, I, I can't stomach it, it's too boring for me. I, I wouldn't do anything creative if it had to sort of put that stress on me. I get enough stress day to day anyway, so when I'm actually drawing and painting, creating, you know what I want to do is make a mess and do my own thing and create some inaccuracies and have fun. And so that's what my art is about. and. The people closest to us can often give us those comments as well. So Tash, my partner, she, um, we, we've gone through, not literally gone through therapy, but we've had many conversations about the kind of <laughs> art she likes and, um, you know, what I'm trying to achieve and things like that. And now she knows how to give, give feedback. She'll say, oh, it's good for that style, but she doesn't like this style and that's fine. Um, but she'll no longer say, oh, it's, I don't like it as her. As her first thing. She doesn't have to like it, but it is a bit disheartening if uh, people close to you constantly say, it's rubbish. She does like some stuff that I do, but it's um, she, what, what she'll do when she says, when she wants me to, to paint something for the house or for a, a present for someone or something like that, she'll say, please can you do it in the style you hate. So we have a, a working relationship in our, in our household. And that, that long waffling story hopefully gives you an idea of what we're trying to achieve here today. It's not to create a perfect bit of art. It's to get a little bit of a, uh, a bit of mental headspace to be able to go traveling and create memories which are mindful, which got you into the place, um, rather than to go from place to place, looking through your camera and never really focusing on the scene. Because I know if I'm taking photos, 
I never look back at my photos really. Sometimes I do, but mostly just look back at them to draw from them. So uh, creating art, a bit of mindfulness, a bit of fun. All the while, hopefully you're seeing that all I'm doing, all this waffling, all I'm doing is picking up on shapes I'm finding in the scene. So just simple, simple shapes that I'm finding. Um, and just hopefully they're enough to suggest what is going on. I'm trying to replicate, because it's a symmetrical building, just replicate what I'm doing one side to the other. So where something's inaccurate on one side, it's inaccurate on the other, but hopefully reasonably symmetrical to create that feeling of this building. And there we have it. With a lot of waffling and some relaxed drawing, we've basically got our scene on the page already. There are a couple of bits we'd probably want to add though. So let's look at adding in just a bit of context. That context we talked about at the beginning, context sort of explains what's going on. So some really simple windows and a suggestion of this wall coming down here. Now we have a building on the left and same on here. The building comes in at about the same height and we can't actually see any windows, but we'll add a window to, again, a window, perhaps a door. We can do a window down here as well. And that adds the context of what's going on. It puts this, this building into a scene rather than being on its own. We don't have to do any more than that outside of our focus. The other bit we've got, we've got this um, sort of lovely light that's coming up in front. What we could do, we could think about where we really want it and whether we need to do it now. We don't have to do it now. What I'm going to do, I'm going to pop in the, the curb at the front here as a double line to give it a bit of uh, more than just a sort of single 2D shape. And then we can take a moment to decide and actually, you know what, let's just do it now. Let's do it now. We could also have done it at the end, but I'm going to move it so it's not directly in front of something important. So I'm going to move it to here. It's going to come up up into about the right height. Nice bold circle, a nice bold line. And there we go. We can make something of that later or it can just disappear into the background as we proceed. And that is it, that's step one, shapes done. All gentle lines, lots of waffling, but really easy. And that is the longest step. Everything from here becomes flowing and loose and, and happy and easy. So all I'm gonna do is apply some really loose colors. So I've got my size 10 brush and I'm gonna take hints from the scene. So what have we got? What is the color of this kind of brickwork here? Well, first I'm gonna ignore my question and apply a bit of water so that I can get the colors to immediately kind of flow around the scene. And this color is kind of a peachy, peachy, uh, pinky, whitey, beigey, there's, it's a beige, but with something else extra going on. So lots of my colors here are very rich. We've got quinacridones, we've got reds, but the key here is water. So to get that light tone, if we just have loads of water, do you see how the more water we get, the softer the water color gets? So if I just add a little bit of red to that quinacridone mix, then I really let it be very watery. Hopefully we can agree that's an all right color. And I can repeat that process in my palette. Bit of quinacridone gold, bit of my scarlet, uh, scarlet lake, which is a, a, a soft red. And we can pop that in. Probably not got enough red in there. So I'm going to pop a little bit of red on the page. And we can now just move that around. Do you see how easily it moves and how gently the colour flows across the page because we pre-wetted the page? And I'm not, I'm not one for neat painting. I'm one for letting the colors do the work, letting it flow around. This stage, this is the loose color stage. So all we're trying to do is get a background of light and loose color. I'm gonna leave that, that's enough for me at the moment. And I'm gonna pick out a brown, a dark brown and a dark blue. And together they'll create something a little gray. And that can come into the top here. That's gonna be the kind of roof, but it's also gonna be this roof. It's also going to be in these windows, in these windows. These windows have got a lot of blue in, but some of them could have some dark in as well. And to make things flow, I'm just going to drag that down. It doesn't matter that it crosses over things where it shouldn't be. We can then add a bit of our pinky red in front as well and see how things are just going to flow, flow and move and blend in front of each other. A couple more touches here and there. 
All I'm trying to do is get a nice bit of variety into that mix. And last we mentioned we got some blues in our window, so let's just pick a nice punchy blue. So I've got a bit of cobalt blue, you could use an ultramarine blue as well. And let's just pop that in there. A little bit of blue here, here. You see how it's spreading and blending? For me, I love that. That's what I really enjoy my watercolours, is having that random effect just occur. Something I can't control happening. If it spreads too far, we come back in with a dry brush, we can lift it up and we can just make it go into the distance or we can come in with a bit of the other colour, pop that on top and it will push the other way. We don't want to overwork things though. Watercolours, once we put them down, they're pretty much down. And we're going to have to learn to live <laughs> in your line and wash career. You're going to have to learn to live with a lot of mistakes, which just happened because watercolours are a rule unto themselves. Lastly, lastly, in our little sort of quick step of loose colours, we'll be popping a little bit of tone into the bottom here. And let's just suggest a touch of sky, just with some splashes. The sky is actually pretty white, isn't it? So we can just do a few splashes, draw in some water, and there we go. Now we let that dry, and we'll come back with our next step using our smaller brush, and apply some bolder colours and start creating a bit more shape so we are back. Now look how this is mostly dry, I can touch it, but places are wet. That's how I like to come back to my paintings. So that there's a little bit of randomness, but also plenty of control compared to before. And we're going to use the same colours, but we're going to have a sort of bolder mix of them. So more colour and less water. That's what we're using. And that is why we use a smaller brush, because that helps with the process. So now we've got, this is what we're using before. Now we've got these kind of bolder marks we can come and add in. Now these bolder marks can start suggesting bits of shadow, perhaps. And this is where we said at the beginning, remember, we said that maybe you want to invent some shadows when the light's not perfect. So here we can invent shadows underneath, um, or at least enhance. There are some soft shadows there, I think. But we're going to enhance them by applying this darker paint. Similarly, you can just go around and enhance some of the ideas of shadows coming around here. And I think if we look carefully, there's a soft shadow which comes all the way down our sort of what I'm calling a cylinder. I'm going to just change the mix a little bit just to keep things interesting and varied. And so I'm going to add this shadow coming down like so, providing something a little bit more interesting, a little bit more bold and just giving a punch and a lift. You see how it comes off the page. That's what this is all about. This step is all about a bit more red then again, and we can have the whole ground floor perhaps, being a little bolder. We can also just apply a few sort of brick marks, little touches, little bits which we can come back to perhaps with our pen in one of the later steps and just make something more of. And then of course we do want some more of our dark colours, so a bit more of our brown and blue mix to create our nice neutral look again, nice and dark now. And this can come in and just really emphasize some of the darks going on up here. Again, it can do some of these windows, so we can blot in some of the windows, some of the top, some of the size, a bit of shape to some of these windows. And I say shape because uh, shadows are what give you a 3D object. With no shadow, an object's invariably a bit 2D. If you start applying shadows, it starts to lift off the page and become more interesting. You can then move and get our cobalt blue again, more bold. Perhaps that one's a little bit too bold and that's why it's useful to test. So we can bring it down a bit and there we go again, drop this blue in. And we're not being too careful. We're painting sort of in the lines, right? But we don't need to be super careful. We can have blue go in the wrong place on purpose. We can have it go up here on purpose. And actually we will make something of it. I'm gonna mix in some of our oranges. So orange and blue neutralize which is why I can mix that together to create some of these darker tones that are going on elsewhere to enhance some of our shadows nice and gently. So these shadows we made with our second wash of colour. And perhaps again, a few little splashes, just a few splashes. Those will soften out. They'll have a bit of fun on the page and then they'll soften out. And I, I always, people who follow my channel will know, I always like adding a little road mark at the front. And perhaps here we can add that yellow to the lamp as well. That's it, our bold colours applied. And I tell you what, what does this look like? It looks like an absolute mess, doesn't it? 
but don't worry about that. That is natural for the painting process. And we're going to be coming back with our pen when this is completely dry and we'll be saving it. We will be bringing back some of that structure. And here we are, we are back. And again, we are this time almost completely dry. There are a couple of slightly wet patches, but we'll just be careful, work around them with our pen. And that's what we're gonna do, come back with our pen. If you have a fine liner, you might want to use a bolder fine liner for this step, or just press a little more firmly. For me, I'm using a fountain pen. So when we use a fountain pen on a page with watercolor, it will naturally be a little bolder. And all we're trying to do now is, as I said, restructure. So we're kind of gonna start by finding some of our shapes again. So I can come down our, our big shape and I can find it. And what I mean is it's disappeared a little bit, hasn't it? Behind some of these lovely watercolors, they've made the lines sort of go into the back, but we want the lines in the front. We want the lines to be providing our watercolor with structure. So I'm gonna approximately go over my lines find new lines if I need to, to capture some of that color, which has gone a bit haywire off to the sides because of how I paint. Um, and in other places, perhaps leave the lines alone because they look great as they are. We can also start applying textures. So some great textures would be little hatch marks. Hatch marks are a lovely use of ink in, uh, in ink and watercolors in line and wash. Other hatch marks might might be to sort of create textures. Perhaps we want to give this a kind of brick-like texture going around this kind of arch. It provides a bit of context uh, to what's going on here, whether it's real or not. It kind of fits the image. And that's what I'd love you to start thinking about, is not just creating marks which are perfect for the scene in front of you, but actually start going, what does my image need? And again, you might upset someone because you might, you know, not be doing a perfect representation of the scene. But if it makes your day more fun, if it makes your art more interesting, um, and if it helps you develop your art skills, your creativity, then I think you've done the right thing, irrespective of whether it becomes a mistake or not. It was the right thing to give it a go. Coming down here, we can create these little details again. And you see, I'm just doing little silly loops, but these loops, they kind of build up just having these little suggestions of detail they build up across the whole scene into a for me at least and this is it's always subjective it's always personal but for me they're enough to suggest the kind of ornate details going on we can come in and find again some of these brick marks and even we can do hatching here little linear marks which just suggest that shadow where we find shadow or where we want to want to find shadow where we want to sort of present a shadow to the viewer of our image. Little hatching in windows can be effective as well. And just getting these dark marks in to really bring those windows to life. Coming across, again, we're getting to the top of the building, we're getting to sort of outlining the key big shape here. So this is where we need to bring our line to the very front. We want these lines to be jumping off the page the most so that the whole building feels centered, feels structured. Coming across here, it's rather a dark area in our image, isn't it? This sort of top, so we just want those bolder lines, not to overwhelm the image, but to suggest that depth and darkness. And again, little bits of hatching can really help with that. So we'll do some little simple hatching. Oh, we don't have to, I'm going to. Uh, you can judge whether mine was a good idea or not, and then make your own decision. And that's a brilliant thing. If you do decide to sketch along with me, um, then you'll be able to create your own version of this. So I'm sure you'll have some ideas from watching me, but you also have things that you go, oh, I really think you shouldn't have done that. And then you won't. And then that's great because you will have created your version and you'll have gone one step closer to your style and making your own decisions about art, which is just a really fantastic place to be in your sort of creative journey, being confident enough to just make your own decision, say you don't like something and do it your way. And there we are, we're almost there. We're just having a little look around. Are there other lines I missed out? And I think actually that's it, that's jumping off the page. So all I want to do now are tiny finishing touches. Something I might do, for example, we've got this little bit of greenery we could add in. To balance that touch of green, I'll do a splash somewhere else, an asymmetrical splash and that balances your colors across the page. We could 
do some really rich blues, just little touches in the windows, little sort of punches of light in the sky, little splashes as well. Same with our, we've got our golds and our reds. So we could just do some tiny little touches in there and even just enhance, we, we popped in these little brick marks in a few places. We can enhance them with a touch of color. And perhaps we could just find some, let's find some murky, murky colors to just enhance some of that shadow. And there we go. That is my scene completed, my little line and wash sketch. Step six, honorary step, is to pop your signature or initials in the image. What I like doing is putting my initial down there and somewhere in my messy line work, I hide my signature. And that is my scene completed. It doesn't take long, even with all of my waffling, it really doesn't take long. And hopefully through this video, you've understood how to choose your scene, sketch your scene. If you enjoy this kind of teaching style, then join me on sketchloose.co.uk or on Skillshare. You'll find details of both of those teaching courses down below. So thank you everyone for watching my little sketching videos. If you enjoy my content, please do subscribe to my channel because it makes me really, really happy. Thanks again.